above all. Jesus' words from the cross, taken from Luke 23, verse 34. Father, said Jesus, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. If there is a more selfless, graceful verse in all of Scripture, I'm not sure what that might be. In this one short sentence, uttered in the last hour of his life on earth, Jesus epitomizes what Christianity is all about. Jesus had reduced the law to two basic rules, love God and love your neighbor, your neighbor being your fellow man. If we break this verse into three parts, we can see how Jesus, despite the horrific circumstances, fulfilled these words. Jesus begins, Father. He doesn't call him Lord, a term of respect and honor. He doesn't call him Creator God, a term of function and awe. Not that they weren't true, but here he calls him Father, a term of relationship and love, and the term he taught us to use when we pray, our Father who art in heaven. Secondly, forgive them. We have a choice when we feel we've been wronged. We can be unforgiving, we can play the blame game and let our hearts become bitter, or we can follow Jesus' example and forgive others just as we hope others will forgive us. We can remember Stephen, who prayed, Lord, do not hold this sin against them, as he was being stoned to death. And we can remember Paul saying to his friends, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. So when Jesus says forgive them, who is he referring to? Is it the soldiers who put him on the cross? Is it Pontius Pilate who gave in to the Jewish leaders? Is it the chief priests and scribes whose livelihood was threatened by Jesus? Is it the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were offended by his teaching? Or is it you and I? Jesus told his disciples, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life is a ransom for many. That's from Mark 10, verse 45. We are the ones he prays to forgive. And thirdly, they do not know what they are doing. Is ignorance an excuse for sin? Does God hold the people who contributed 
to Jesus' death responsible for their sins? Yes, God is a just God. They had just seen Jesus' miracles and they'd heard God's truth from his lips, but they did not understand the magnitude of their sin. As Paul tells us, none of the rulers of his age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Paul can certainly identify with that. Before his wake-up call on the road to Damascus, he had mercilessly persecuted Christians. In 1 Timothy, he says, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Let us pray. Father, forgive us. We often don't know the depths to which we have fallen. Help us to realize and never forget the love you have for us. Cancel out our debt of sin to you, we pray. Not because we deserve it, but out of your great mercy revealed by the cross. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who died on that cross, to save us from our sins. Amen. Thank you. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verse 43. When I reflect upon this passage, I can't help but think that it is hugely important, that it might in fact be the entire point of the Gospels boiled down to a single sentence. Let me explain. When he spoke these words, Jesus was hanging on the cross between two condemned criminals who had been crucified for their crimes. One of the two doomed men had just been taunting Jesus, mocking him and daring him to use his power to save them all from punishment. But the other criminal had come to Jesus' defense confessing his own guilt, professing the Lord's innocence, and then asking to be remembered when he came into his kingdom. The answer Jesus gave to that man's plea, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise, 
is for me perhaps the most profound illustration of his purpose in coming to earth that he came to save sinners he didn't come just for strict followers of the law or people with money or people who came from certain places or indeed any criteria with which humans label each other and themselves he came for everyone he was in agony up on that cross yet he was still willing and able to give assurance of salvation to a criminal a man who by his own admission and by the condemnation of society obviously deserved no such thing but none of that mattered Jesus forgave him anyway and promised him heaven this act of transcendent mercy makes a couple of things very clear the first is that salvation from sin is for everyone who goes to Jesus with a repentant heart regardless of what we've done in the past he loves us so much that he wants us all to go to him just like that criminal did the second is that it is Jesus himself who chooses the saved we mortals however righteous we may feel that we are are in no position to judge anyone else as being unworthy of seeking salvation salvation through Jesus period so if we are not to prevent anyone from seeking a relationship with Jesus it follows that we should help them instead we need to be welcoming to come alongside and encourage people who don't yet know God but are seeking to learn no matter who they are by speaking these words during his own execution to a convicted criminal the lowest of the low the Lord is showing us in the clearest possible way his true purpose in coming to earth as a humble mortal man he came to bring us broken as we are sinners that we are to himself amen In Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love! What depths of peace when fears are still, when striving sees my comfort, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ, I stand in Christ alone, who took on flesh. Fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. On him was made, here in the death of Christ I live. This is a conversation centered around Matthew 19, verses 26 and 27. First, a little background. 
Jesus and his disciples met a rich young man who asked Jesus, what good thing must I do to have eternal life? Jesus explains that he must keep the commandments, namely, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and your mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. Assuring Jesus that he keeps these commandments, he asks, what do I lack? And Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, sell all your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. The rich man went away sad because he had great wealth. The commandment that Jesus didn't mention is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The young man put the love of wealth before his love of God. The disciples then ask, who can be saved? In Matthew 19, verse 26, Jesus replies, Men cannot do it by themselves. Only with God are all things possible. According to Ephesians, it is by God's grace that we are saved. Grace is the unmerited love and favor of God toward human beings. It is divine influence acting in a person to make the person pure and morally strong. This is the condition of a person brought to God's favor through this influence, a special virtue, a gift, or help given to a person by God. Grace, God's grace allows us to pursue good works. His grace enables us to be all that God intends us to be. In Matthew 19, 27, Peter answers Jesus, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus says, I tell you the truth. At the renewal of all things, and the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you will have followed me, you who have followed me will sit on the twelve thrones and will judge the twelve tribes of Israel. Those who have left their parents, their brothers, sisters, children, and possessions behind for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. So what happens to us at our time of death? John tells us that Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home if this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you, so that you will always be with me where I am. Christians do not need to fear death, because death is not a loss, but the final victory. Eternal life forever in God's presence awaits us on the other side. Thank you.
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus' fourth cry on the cross is heartrending. Crying out in his native Aramaic language, Jesus Christ cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus feels absolutely and utterly forsaken as he has been brutally tortured and then nailed to hang on a cross outside Jerusalem. This is the experience of Jesus. This is how far the Son of God was prepared to go for you and for me. That's part of the point of Good Friday, isn't it? We aren't just recalling an historical event, although certainly the crucifixion of Jesus is a historical reality. We also need to acknowledge a theological fact. To restore justice to the world, to reconcile us to our Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ went through unimaginable suffering leading up to his death. Wrongdoing requires redress. Instead of our suffering, the full consequences of our rebellions, both huge and petty, Jesus Christ took on the world's pain and experienced the utter desolation of being forsaken by his heavenly father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Lord Jesus understood himself to be the fulfillment of Old Testament scriptures. We need to note here, the Lord Jesus is actually quoting from Psalm 22, which begins, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So cries the psalmist, David. Without knowing the full significance of his cry, David is actually anticipating Jesus' shriek of anguish upon the cross. Psalm 22 moves from these words of lament to refocusing on God's goodness and restoration. Even at this most terrible hour, Good Friday points ahead to Easter. Death is followed by resurrection. Perhaps we don't draw on the Psalms enough, especially during this pandemic with widespread sickness and death and widespread social disruption. Perhaps we need to use more the Psalms of Lament. If we let him, God can use the disruptions in our lives, even what seems to be most tragic, to refocus on God's gracious care and ultimate redemption. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Certainly Jesus felt abandoned, but that's not all. Something objective and terrible and real is taking place. This darkness has taken over the whole land. Do we realize that God hates sin? We are for more likely to be accommodating especially of our own sins. We tend to make excuses. I was tired, had a couple of drinks. She had it coming. We are sometimes far too comfortable with our sins against God, ourselves, and our neighbors. 
but God hates sin. The living God of purity and light, of perfect love, detests sin and what sin does to his creation. God perceives sin for what it truly is, filthy rebellions against God, ultimately, and his creation. So when Jesus Christ bears all the sin of history, that sin is repellent, stinking, odious, hateful to his heavenly Father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That cry is terribly disturbing to us, as it should be. But it points us deeper into the heart of God, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ himself. It's also a mirror pointing at us. Lastly, let's not forget that the horrible cry of Jesus points us back to Psalm 22 and thereby to Scripture itself. On this day of somber reflection, let's weigh what Jesus Christ went through for us. May that lead us to deep repentance, and then to Easter glory. Amen. Could you see the dawn of the darkest day? Christ on the road to Calvary. Tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then.
So I was asked to do a meditation on John 19:28, um, and this is one of the final words of Jesus on the cross. So after this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, "I am thirsty." I think that this last word on the cross really um, helps us to remind ourselves that Jesus is not only just a divine person; um, he's both human and divine. So this really brings to mind the duality, or sort of the, the two natures of Jesus. Um, he's not just the person who quells the waves, or who heals the sick, or sends out evil spirits. Jesus is indeed um, a person. So this is a divine and human um, Jesus who's on the cross, and who is experiencing things that you and I would experience ourselves. So Jesus physically feels a thirst. Um, for something to drink as he's suffering on the cross. Um, so to think about that and to, to recognize that God would offer himself up in such a way and take on a nature that is so physical and so relational to ourselves is very, very powerful. Um, Jesus thirsts not only for water, but he also thirsts for a spiritual or a a fulfillment of, of his purpose, of the Father's purpose for him. So, when we reflect on Jesus' thirst, it's, it's both physical and, and divine, just as he is both uh, human and, and divine himself. And at this time, I think that this brings us to remember our own thirst, our spiritual thirst for Jesus at this time, um, and that Jesus is the one who, who quenches our spiritual thirst for him.
The icy rain is almost a mist in the early morning light. The corpse of winter is showing in the dirty banks of snow diminishing day by day, and the barren trees wait for the enlivening of the sun. The desolation of early spring yet holds the memory of summer's past, and the green shoots awakening the earth bring promise of the summer abundance to come. Winter is finally finished, I say. And yet, even as I speak that, I know in one sense it's not the truth. Winter will come again, and again, and again. And even when my body lies under the frozen earth, spring and summer, fall and winter will come again. And death will come. Yet birth will happen too, and the DNA of my being will be carried on in the bodies of children yet unborn. Buried in the very core of our being is some sense of a paradox, a sense of an unending eternity, and yet the chilling specter of death and the end. From the mundane of dishes that are done, but will need to be washed again tomorrow, to the reality that war and poverty and death and reconciliation and blessing and birth are always intertwined and always returning in human history. None of it, of it is ever truly finished. Yet the voice of an anguished God rings through the centuries with a cry we know instinctively, speaks to something unique something that had never happened in our world before and will never happen again. It is finished. That reality is pinned to a cross and cannot be contained in three short words. Words strain, crack, and sometimes break under the burden, says T.S. Eliot. In these three words, it is finished can only point to a truth too vast for our finite minds to understand. No language can express it, and we can only apprehend it in part with our souls. What is finished? What is the it? Theologians have struggled to find words for that truth to which these two tiny letters point for centuries. Yet all the books in all the world cannot hold the horror of the consequences of evil now contained not in that tiny word, but in the very body of the word made flesh and writhing on that tree. Humankind cannot bear very much reality, says Eliot, and we look away, for in the body of the God-man before us is all the suffering and sin all the brokenness and pain, all the death and loss and desolation that has ever been and ever will be born in a single body on a cross. No human being could bear it. Yet this human does. For this human is also God. No words can express it. But this word contains it, for only the immeasurable love of an infinite God, whose very nature it is to love, can defeat the depravity and evil that spoiled paradise. That evil, that bent to sin, wound itself into the very DNA of every human being born of that disobedient pair, until the weight of centuries of pain and the reality of the death of all things could be crushed by the word made flesh, who is love greater than all our sin. St. Paul would wrestle to find words to express this and finally settles for saying death has no more dominion over him. In a once for all absolute termination with no repeat, no cycling over and over again, the author of life has conquered death. What is finished? Sin and its power 
and the death that is evil's ultimate victory is defeated by a love that is so great it will bear all the pain and the horror and die that we might live. On that cross is the word that will not break, that cannot break under the burden, but will bear it, contain it, and redeem it for all time and eternity. And we who live in a seemingly endless cycle of now and not yet, we who seem to perpetually repeat that cycle of sin and repentance and forgiveness and grace, know in the quietness of the night, in the core of our beings, that there is indeed a finish to this, an end that, though it lies before us, yet day to day grows stronger in us as we are conformed to the image of Christ. And the word that spoke hope in that agonized cry of victory, it is finished, whispers that hope to us in the night times of our fears. And the life that is love grows. And the word that speaks life lives. And the power of death and sin, that power, it is finished.
speaking to the Father. We see his complete trust in the Father. Jesus entered death at the same way he lived each day of his life, offering up his life as a perfect sacrifice and placing himself in God's hands. Jesus, willing to say, to give his life, Jesus faced the incredible task of laying down his life as a ransom for the world. This task was traumatic and overwhelming, but Jesus accepted it willingly. After hanging on the cross for three hours, Jesus finally gave up his own life. He was not helpless at the hands of those who crucified him. He alone had the authority to end his life. In Matthew 20, 28, Jesus said, The Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. The crucifixion was the plan, and it was his plan from before creation. He, he's the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. Are we willing to take up our cross and trust God with his plan for our life? Trust that he has a plan for us to prosper, not to harm us. A plan to give us hope and a future. Jeremiah 29, 11. As we struggle through this time of unknowing and ongoing pandemic, are we willing to trust God and to let us, us to, trust God and to get us through our struggles? Are we able to trust, love, pray to and worship the Lord, rather than descend into despair? Be encouraged, the Lord is with you, to bring his peace and joy into our situation. Lord, you know how much we are all struggling at this difficult time and circumstances. Help us to trust in your goodness and love so that we can worship you and experience your peace.
In prayers. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we're bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. There's not traditionally a blessing for a Good Friday service because in a sense the service concludes on Easter day, but here's a blessing anyway. May the God of peace who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, Make you perfect in every good work that you may do his will, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Take care. Again. Thank you for the cross, my friend.